Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Zeitcast. My name is Jonathan Martin, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to get to share a dear friend of mine to you, uh, Ben Cat. I've so been looking forward to this conversation. He's been very patient with lots of technical issues on my end for this to happen. Uh, but it's so important to me that this does happen because he has written a gorgeous new book that I'm just wild about. Uh, it is very rare that I respond on quite as much of a soul and cellular level as I feel like I have to this work, which I want to say more uh, about here in a second. But first, uh, Ben, I'm just so happy you're here. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks for having me. And, you know, I'm glad we worked through whatever the the technical difficulties were, because, uh, you know, this conversation is meant to happen. And you're meant to, uh, you know, get this this podcast up and running again. You got a lot to say and a lot of great folks to share with the world. So thanks for uh, having me uh, join you here. Mm. Well, thank you for saying that. I do believe this is meant to happen. And the resistance worth powering through. Uh, ben is a meditation teacher and coach, uh, formerly an ordained pastor, uh, which I know we'll talk just a little bit more about. But his book that's coming out Feb February 24th, is that right? February 20. Is that the 20. release date? 20. Oh, the 20th. Okay, great. The, uh, the Way Home. What a book. I was so honored to get to endorse the book. And I want to read that endorsement uh, straight to you because it very much came from a deep place in me. I've never read anything that illuminated my own life more, illuminating my own journey with dangerous, remarkable clarity. Ben Katz, The Way Home is the rare book that happens to you. These stories will crack open your own stories. These words will give you language you can find yourself in. This is sage wisdom without any of the pretentiousness, soulful, vulnerable, tender, experiential. The Way Home is also rare in that it fully delivers on the title, If Home is What You Long For, this book will absolutely guide you there. It's just a wonderful book, and I'm so thrilled it's coming into the end of the world. Ben, maybe, th th and that's such a sincere thing for me. It's a spiritual book, a book about a spiritual journey that delivers on the title. Hmm. That's so rare. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm grateful you. for that. And uh, it so mirrors my own soul's journey in, in, uh, in so many ways, really. I'd love for you to do the thing here that you do in the book that I thought was so helpful. And I wish more books came with something like this. Even establishing language for this kind of journey uh, is can be, a, can be delicate. And I love that you actually give us some handles right out of the gate in terms of some of the words that you use, some of the phrases that have been important um, for the road that you've been walking. So I'd love if maybe first we could start there with a couple of words that have been significant for your own story. Yeah, you know, that was a really fun thing to put together. And I appreciate my um, publisher's advice in doing that. So the language of the journey that I put right up in front of the book to be, you know, looked at as a foreshadowing what's to come or just passed over and people can dive right into the book. It includes everything from kind of um, little things that describe what I would call like mystical moments that I have that I talk about along the journey. So for example, the Jaguar dream I have, or the owl encounter where I meet an owl in the woods, or really were three words that came to me at just the right moment when I was super burned out. And um, they're from like a, a Mad Men era Jaguar automobile advertisement that I came across through a sequence of events. Um, and they invited me into to receive grace and slow down my pace and you know, make space for solitude. So there's those kinds of things, but then there's also language that maybe we might come across in other, uh, you know, spiritual books or maybe um, somewhat psychological language. So, um, you know, one of the terms I use is, is imposter or imposter identity. And um, because a big thing, part of, you know, what this book is about is getting to a point in my life where I realized that the ways that I was moving through the world, even though they had, had served me for a really long time, um, they just didn't work anymore. And I was overly attached to certain ways of, um, you know, to certain patterns of being obsessed with achievement and um, trying to be a perfectionist and performing to please others, like all these kinds of things. And I named those as my imposter so there's a there's a, a whole bunch more terms and um 
you know, why I wanted to share those is I think, you know, there are universal aspects to this journey. And that's a big part of what I talk about in the book. And yet, um, everyone's journey is unique. So I would say that that um, is really a, a glossary that combines both unique terminology for myself, and stuff that other people will um, find really helpful for their journeys. Um, as you were setting some of that up, Ben, and even you referenced the um, the Jaguar ad and and dreams. This is this is all stuff that so connects for me because uh, I mean I always attribute it to growing up Pentecostal. I feel like it turned me into such an accidental mystic in terms of paying attention to everything in that way and. and I'm so convinced, I don't want to impose this on anybody else, but I'm so convinced that everybody has these experiences. Here's the voice, their connections, but, and I understand why people don't necessarily attend to those things. You kind of choose to pay attention to that or not, to take it seriously or not. So I'm curious how you came to take such things <laughs> seriously, that whether it's in dreams or in ads, that you are kind of just listening to your life and reading everything that's happening to you in that in, in a way that is open to some kind of a larger story. Yeah, right. It's like a little out there sometimes for for some people. And um, you know, what I what I well, so I'll give you a little backstory. This um the book before it was a book, it was a one man show, one night only on my 39th birthday. Um, I came out of this like soul searching six year season of life and with a very clear sense that um, some some guides and spiritual directors had encouraged me. It's like it was time. I mean, I literally came out of a canyon. I went on like a two week um, quest in the desert, but also came out of like these canyon years of my life. And I was challenged to um, do a project, do something that would embody and carry forward what I had learned and discovered. And um this was about, you know, say six months before my birthday. And, and I, I came out of the canyon and I knew what I had to do. And um, there was this show that I was going to do. And it was called Mr. Mystical, which is like a playful title. I think it's kind of funny. Um, Mr. Mystical is sort of me in the story, but it was like part sermon, right? A former mm -hmm. pastor, part like stand up comedy, part performance art. And I, I was going to do it. I did do it one night only. And there's a reason for that is because part of what I learned through this whole experience was, as I alluded to earlier, is how attached I was to outcomes. And even though the work I did as a pastor was in um, what I would describe, I mean, it was very meaningful work, sort of very virtuous work, um, in a lot of ways, very humble work. Like I wasn't yeah. a pastor at a big flashy church. It's like helping people um, who were unhoused and dealing with mental illness and dealing with substance addiction, right? It was like very ordinary neighborhood level stuff, beautiful. But that's part of what enabled me to kind of hide from the fact that I was very, you know, I was very driven and um, was always trying to do kind of unique things that would stand out. Anyway, so I do the show one night only so that I can just enjoy being present to the experience, enjoy making something for the pure delight of doing it and not for what it leads to, right? So I do that, Mr. Mystical, and and it's me t telling these stories from this six-year period of my life, these encounters I had. But it wasn't, you know, this wasn't the first time that I had opened myself up to these messages. I mean, I, I grew up um, in a church tradition that didn't really value experience. So like the reform tradition is very much more like focused on doctrine, right? And experienced beautiful community and so many incredible, you know, was a part of a like this cloud of witnesses saw people doing incredible transformational things around the world. And yet this experience thing was always kind of like, we didn't really let, you know, there wasn't a lot of room for that. But when I was in college, I came across some folks and even had some experiences before that, where I was just like, undeniably felt like I've been having this conversation with, with God, with the divine, with something more with spirit. Um, so I had a whole kind of charismatic season in college, at which I would say opened the doors wide to being open to this. Um, and I never sort of gave up on the conversation, just kept paying attention. Um, and it was especially clear in the season of my life that I needed to, to kind of um, listen more deeply, like in some sense, I had stopped listening. So um, yeah, that's what I'll say, I'm gonna add one more thing, because I know it's sort of a long answer. But I do want to say, great. 
for the people who are skeptical about this stuff, one of the things I referred to in the book is the work of Dr. Lisa Miller, who has a book called mm. um, the, I believe it's the awakened brain. And she, she's out of uh, Columbia university in New York. And she's demonstrated scientifically that, you know, there's certain parts of the brain that um, light up and are strengthened because of, you know, these sort of like spiritual experience. And actually that stuff, it yeah. corresponds uh, with like, when people are dealing with a lot of depression, there's less activity in that area of the brain. Um, so there's a whole thing that she talks about is the importance of, so even if we kind of move away from spiritual terms, or talking about as mystical, she invites us to cultivate the awakened where, awareness, which is more of a bottom up process that it is expansive, is a wider perceptual field that we're picking up on more things instead of the top-down processes, which she would call the achievement orientation, which is like, I'm in a room, I'm really focused, I need to talk to that person, or I need to do this thing because it's going to get me that. There's absolutely a place for that. We need to send emails, we need to coordinate things. Um, but there's this whole, you know, growing body of research that's saying that, you know, as humans, we are wired for this way of um, moving through the world in which we're paying attention to the stuff of life. So there, yeah. you know, it encompasses all of it. Yeah, I love that. Well, you know, being the director of the Center for Spiritual Life uh, here at DePaul, one of the things that I've become fond of saying, and I don't know where I got this, it's one of the things that's sort of jammed out from my because I'll define words the way that I want to, and I'm kind of like, no, no one else would define it this way, but then I tell people very <laughs> authoritatively, well, you know, this is what this means. But whenever I talk about spirituality <laughs> now, it's what I always say is that spirituality is the connection between things. That's all it is, the connection between things. Like, how do we, everybody, no matter what they believe about God, life, death, the big questions, is in a process of making meaning, which involves making connections yes. in the way, and it... Which I, I feel that. that sense of lighting up reading your story is that, mm. you know, the way that you're connecting the experiences and that you can't deny, that you can't help but uh, take seriously, which I love, by the way, that you experimented with uh, with this these kind of charismatic experiences in college. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and, totally. And, and, and that that held up in some way, because that's, you know, that's always the thing for me, too, is that I haven't I haven't lost that language of spirit, that sense of spirit, but it has taken me into some places that I would not have anticipated. And I love yeah. the way that you, uh, you know, Father Rohr's whole language of transcend and include, I feel so much of that happening here, not rejecting or denying what happened before, but mm -hmm. expanding and opening up to more as yeah. you go. You know, and part of what I'm convinced about is like, I do believe we all have these experiences. We use different language for them. We want to um, minimize them at times, right? Because they're, they're often these things that if, you know, whether or not we use this term, they're like the most sacred experiences we ever have. Like they're ineffable, right? They're beyond, we can't put words to them. And also they might be totally ridiculous, which like some of my yeah. stories are. I believe that like at once this like the, like a sacred foolishness, these things are woven together. Um, and and here's the thing I say, it's like, why not pay attention to them? Yeah. Like, what, what do you have to lose? And I'll, I, I'll add, especially what do you have to lose if you're in a moment in life where you have, you, like I was, where you sense like there's more for you, where you sense that like the version of you that's shown up in the world is expired. It doesn't work anymore. Why not pay attention to these moments and see where they lead you? Um, you know, the like Celtic tradition, they have this wonderful concept of, you know, the wild goose. It's like the wild goose chase, right? Chase in the spirit. The, so it might feel like it's a dead end, might feel like a tangent, but you never know when a few years down the road, this one connection or interaction or experience is the th exact thing that leads to a moment of transformation or opens up a whole new world to you. I love that, Ben. And, th and that sense of unfolding of things opening up. I might want to even lean more into this, the first half of this question in a minute, but clearly in your own experiences, I mean, to get to where you are, everybody goes through disillusionment. But I love that this is not a book that's full of angst. I don't sense a lot of angst. I don't sense any bitterness. And yet there is this, like, this sense of movement. I know I don't want to impose this onto your story, but I know part of my experience in terms of 
Because see, being a pastor, same kind of thing. I feel like most of what I've done in that way in my life has been stuff I still believe in. Like really Mm -hmm. what feels like being in the thick of things with people and their real lives. But the thing I feel like my ministry background, theology background, all least prepared me for, I still feel like in those spaces, nobody told me, maybe other, I'm sure other people are in places where they heard it. Nobody was telling me that, you know, anything about first and second half of life or Mm. how much of what I was doing was an ego building project. Mm -hmm. And it really, I'm trying to tell people how to live, but I'm also still in that same sort of accumulate, build thing that everybody else is doing. Yes. So then when I started hitting the wall, like I had no idea what that was. That just felt like falling apart. It felt like failure. Like, did you, did you get resources where you came from to rise those shifts when they were when they were happening or was it just frightening because for me most of that was just yeah no i i would say i I would say it was it was scary because um you know the 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 ironic thing about yes i'm gonna make (laughs) it's like a broad statement does not apply everywhere to be clear but like one of the ironies of of like the church is there's this treasure this absolute treasure of a story right um and with a whole spectrum of what you may believe in it or how you relate to it. But the story of on the other side of losing it all on the other side of death and passing through the wilderness and the, the darkness of the tomb or whatever it is that there is new life. There's resurrection. Um, I think, you know, I quote Barbara Brown Taylor. I think she says something, you know, new life begins in the dark. Like that's where it, it always starts. This is a central uh, aspect of the Christian story. And, and I'm not saying what I'm not going to, I'm not saying it's like people don't live that out and embody it. Oh, we, I've sure. seen so many people doing that. And yet there is a level of depth to it that I don't think I was introduced to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it, 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 that I don't think I was introduced to that. There's a sense that, um, it sometimes is easier to, to live into it just vicariously in a sense through Jesus or, you know, that there's a sense of, or acknowledging that you're leaving something or believing certain things rather than really undergoing it. So um, if, if that makes sense, I, I just feel yeah. like this whole season of my life drew me into the deeper meaning of these, these, these things and these stories, um, these teachings that I had been around my whole life and helped me see this pattern in other places, other traditions, other cultures, other stories that we're surrounded with. Um, so, you know, and absolutely what the powerful thing is when you go through this sort of midlife shift, move from the shed, the first half of life, you've outgrown something and moving the second, guess what? The, the tradition you come from, the tradition I come from, there are like, there's an ab- abundant, um, like, like a, a abundant toolkit of things to support us yeah. in walking on that path. Yeah. That's so good. And when you if we talk about even drawing some of those resources from within a tradition, because and you need to talk about Celtic Christianity. I mean, there are these very mystical experiential. I just find that, and I really don't mean this is a way to to dunk on anybody else, but the thing that did preoccupy a lot of my time and attention in the first half of my life, which was changing how people believe, get them to pray a prayer. And and here's the, the thing about, I'm, I'm actually weirdly so comfortable with creedal Christianity. The, the story that the church has been given to me is, is, you know, is one that I take very seriously, but I also just see that I feel like what you say you believe in terms of like what you think, I just observe consistently that it makes almost no qualitative difference in anybody's life, what they say or what they think about almost anything. Whereas what I find now so much more deeply embedded in the Christian story, this experience Mm. of death and resurrection. Now that, that can convert you. Mm. That is something like being born again, but it's just Mm. interesting how far it's come for me in terms of that is it nearly as connected to language as it used to be for me mm-hmm. and much more like this wanting people to go on this way, mm. which often involves kind of unraveling. Uh, yes. I, I hear that so much in your story of the book. There's a lot of unraveling that happens in order yeah. to, to make yourself available to this. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what's coming to my mind as you were just saying that is um, the like 
religious spaces have such a, a there's such a potential and power to be these transformative places and also there's a way that uh, in certain forms they absolutely um want to avoid death okay so that's yeah. in, at an institutional level yeah um, at, you know, at all sorts of levels. And then that in some ways gets passed on to the participants. Like we, we take that on and, and guess what, for good reason in a way, because it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying to, to step away from what you've known to who you've been, to how you've defined yourself. Um, you know, perhaps people especially feel that like when it's related to the work they do in the world. Um, right. We have a high sense of attachment to like, I am what I do, that kind of thing. Um, but there's all sorts of ways that when we we like outgrow things, um, it doesn't lead right to and everything's great and I have it all figured yeah. out. Like there's yeah. this there's this what feels like a bottomless pit, um, and you know certain spaces we we because there is and this is where I'll get a lot of credit say to the Christian tradition. There's such a beautiful story, a hopeful story, um, but we want to get get to that thing right away instead of realizing that there there's this like valley of the shadow that of death that like you might have to pass through through years of your life doesn't mean there's no hope there doesn't mean it's like a totally barren place but it it's going to be excruciating yeah. um and so you know those kinds of we kind of gloss over some of that and I, again i realize there's like generalizations to what i'm saying i'm not trying to just like slam anyone or any particular sure. thing but i'm just saying there are levels of depth to um these stories that maybe we don't access to the fullest extent and I have sympathy for that. I realize why, because it is torturous. Absolutely, because who doesn't want to live in denial of death? I mean, I, I feel like for a number of years now, I talk about death all the time in ways that are <laughs> weird because I'm I'm probably as avoided as I've ever been to really hmm. think about it. I don't want to think about, I'm always worried about my parents as they're getting older. I worry about my dog. I worry about everything that happens to our kids. I, I'm as afraid of death as, as anybody, but you know, it was a... When I read Catherine Dowling Singh's book, The Grace and Dying, years ago, this kind of Buddhist Christian who was PhD hospice chaplain, no book ever unlocked my brain quite that much because it helped me to see, oh, actually, this is what Christianity has been about. Oh, right, the cross. There's really no way. Death is 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 the path to life. And I think that's the thing that's easy to to bury because, you know, whether whatever your faith system is, even as Americans, it feels like so much of our culture is built on this kind of denial of the reality of death yeah. and dying. Onward and upward, right? It's like always um, improving and things getting better and um, we can overcome whatever, like almost effortless. You know, there's just all these narratives that um, don't really help us uh, understand and embrace the reality of like what it takes. So, but I think, you know, most often, this all what does invite us into that more than anything it's it's these moments in our life and whether that's like yeah. what i'm saying kind of these mystical moments or um you know people with traumatic like who've experienced deep trauma it's mm -hmm. you know there's a reason why the person who almost like dealt with cancer for years but came out the other side is like filled with joy there's a reason why you know you've met those people who've like lost a child and like endured the unbearable and yet there's a certain way they're moving through the world that is um, just filled with power, right? Like there's a reason it's because these people have, mm -hmm. you know, descended into the depths. And I think part of, you know, what I came to terms with in my own journey is I had to, um, I came to terms with the fact that like, even though I have not experienced the kind of kinds of trauma that so many other people have, mm -hmm. And then also because of certain identities I've, you know, I hold, um, there's a way that I've been like, I've been able to avoid a whole bunch of things. And yet, and yet, um, guess what? I carry pain. Yeah. And I think if I don't process that pain, I absolutely pass it on. And um, so if I, if, yeah, so I absolutely have to do that. And, and um so that's what I set out to do. And of course, to, to like work through there, there was definitely layers. There was just stuff that was my own stories and narratives. There was stuff from my family. There's stuff from my religious background. There's stuff from um, kind of broadly society culture. Like there's just layers and layers and layers. Um, and I guess the reason I want to name that is not to like 
celebrate myself, but as I say, there's a lot of ways. I wrote this book to help people who, who sometimes feel like they they maybe haven't like had their life totally fall apart. They haven't yeah. undergone like horrible things, but guess what? There's so many other ways that we we lose our heart. There's so many other ways that we become estranged from who we are, and just because we're not like you know we haven't hit rock bottom doesn't mean that we can't begin that journey back to ourselves. Yeah, man, that's that's so helpful, and I I feel that sense of permission in the book. Um, I feel like it's important in this moment in so many ways because it's like on the one hand I hear this in what you're saying. We know um, that in terms of where we've lived and how we've lived, and uh, that we don't have the same challenges that other people do. Um, but I, I feel like that's been a thing I've had to kind of like come back around on is all right it's not helpful for me to negate my own experience, my own pain. Well, yeah, it may not be as dramatic. I feel like that's a, that's a key for so many people is that mm-hmm. the stuff that's happening just doesn't feel all that dramatic. Yes. And, and so then it's like, they don't yeah. give us themselves permission yeah. to see the meaning in what's happening. Cause it's like, Oh, it's not, well, somebody else is dealing with something harder. Or somebody else is dealing yes. with real trauma. And it's like, no, no, it's all right for you to name your own yes. pain, your own joy. It's, o- it's okay to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I agree 100% that we might, I think in our in our society, we, we are really um, sort of obsessed with, and I'll say it, like the heroic journey, and I'll come back yeah. to that in terms of the title of my book. But we love, we love like the, everything falling apart and the person coming, you know, rising from the ashes like a phoenix. Like we love the dramatic stories. Those are the those are the books that usually sell. Those are the sure. the movies we watch. Okay. Um there's a place for that. And guess what? You know, whenever we encounter people like that, it's incredible. Um but the reality is there there's a there's a danger in some of that because we start to live just think we can just like live vicariously through someone else mm. and we become dismissive of the contours of our own life that are this pattern of, you know, of, of where we're being invited to to leave what's familiar and fall into the unknown and rise to our own wholeness. Like our, each of us has our own version. Um, it just might like, to, you know, as you just said, it's like not necessarily as dramatic. That doesn't mean um, just like we should ignore it. Now, one of the reasons I, I like kind of using, you know, the hero's journey. So this is Joseph Campbell, the famous mythologist. This was his, you know, the way that he talked about this whole, pattern of um he really talked about you it's three stages and it's like um there's a departure and initiation you undergo and um the return and he looked at all these myths and stories and he found this pattern and there's a lot we can say about that i don't really get into it in the book but there's you know there's some more nuances that maybe he missed but it's really helpful that he names this pattern okay um one of the reasons i like i mean it's great that's in the title because the hero's journey to wholeness is it, it acknowledges that like when I came out of this season of my life and I was reading his stuff, I realized it was like a mirror. I was like, oh my goodness, like this is reflects what I've undergone. Okay. But there's another way I like to sort of playfully think of, I, it's like almost like a Trojan horse, which by the way, isn't in one of the ancient, well, it's not in, uh, it's mentioned in Homer's Odyssey mm-hmm. and it comes after the Iliad, but it's this, you know, the story of, um, they're invading Troy and there's this horse and all these soldiers hide in it. And it's the, the people of Troy think, oh, it's like a, what, what's like a statue for, or something, you know, we'll, we'll bring it in here. And they didn't know it was filled with soldiers, including Odysseus who come and attack and, and conquer them. But um, I kind of, so we hear this language in our culture, the Trojan horse, maybe that was unnecessary to explain. I just figured I should explain it. But, but I like the, the fact that this, you know, you describe my book in some ways that I really appreciate but there's a way that, you know, the book has 10 steps. I kind of like that it's, mm. it's yeah. oh, a hero's journey. Like there's a sense, oh, it's accessible. And yeah. if I'm someone who's driven and I'm someone who like wants to like kind of be productive and like go through this journey, I'm, I might pick this book up, you know, because it will help me become more heroic. A little bit of a twist. Guess what? Like it's a brutal journey. A, B, yeah. um, you know, I think that there's, it calls forth vulnerability, it calls for humility, um, this journey to wholeness. So I think that there's a way it also works on us in terms of maybe some of these stereotypes we have about what these heroic journeys need to look like. There's a different sort of um, 
a different way of being that it's in inviting us into. Yeah. I do love that, Ben, structurally, by the way, what you do with the book, because I feel like um, there's so much good that is in the self-help world, but I feel like the bridge that kind of needs to be built is nothing wrong with steps or processes, but there needs to, they need to actually work <laughs> as opposed to like glamorizing because then, oh, well, I did I did the fast or yeah. I did the thing and it's... now I, I haven't got the results. And, yes. and I love that. I feel like you do, though, in ways that feel responsible, hmm. kind of give give us handles hmm. for how we can go on a journey like that. And and the, the practicality of that is one of the things I find most helpful about the book. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, and the thing is, so just for the listener, for example, there's like, I, I, I make these really accessible. It's like you answer the call or you face your death or um, give your gift. So these very succinct things, of course, if you dig into any one of them, there's just like, there's, they're filled with complexity. They're, they're filled sure. with, with struggle. Um, but I named some of them just to say like, yeah, there's a template here and there it's, there, there's a pattern. And also these things unfold in each of our lives in distinct ways. So yeah, I really hope it's, um, you know, like a, a roadmap for people. I set out to write it because I was like, I wish I would have had a yeah. book like this because guess what and, and i know jonathan you're like a well-read person there's like there's stuff that you've dug into that like most people probably aren't like it's just a little mm. thick it doesn't mean it's over their heads it's just like eh, no it's or it's like too nerdy in a particular sure. lane and there's stuff resources that really helped me like for example this book called soul craft by bill plotkin just a huge influence on me and yet i mean this thing is like it's like the size of the bible mm. <laughs> it's like it's huge and um and I was like, like I got into it, but it it also, you know, I've told other people about it and it just hasn't, you know, resonated with them in the same yeah. way. Um, or even Joseph Campbell's stuff, like it's really good and also can be super dense and kind of like, really, do I want to be like researching this stuff right now? Maybe not. So the mm -hmm. idea is to like, how can we talk about these things that are complex? Um, how can we... Um, you know, tune into these, these wisdom traditions in, in a way that's like, meets us where we're at in our own lives, right? It doesn't pull us out of them, um, but like meets us in, in the middle of the mess that we're in. Yes. Yes. I love that. Well, and um, cause it does feel so, it feels so accessible and not, I, I was thinking the other day about Thomas, I think it was Merton's thing about like praying for however many humiliations they, I never feel like I have to pray that prayer because I feel like my humiliations come regardless. They're just sort of always, <laughs> they're always happening. But I do like, I do love that there is such a humility and a lack of pretentiousness to this work in that way. It feels like, oh yeah, everybody's able to recognize themselves mm. in the stories that you, that you tell. And it gives them resources to be able to name what some of these things mean while they're mm. happening and how we can lean into them and how we can mm. explore them. Um, something I want to ask you, Ben, that's uh, just, I, I legitimately am curious about knowing that your background, like mine, in terms of, you know, you planning churches and leading churches, when we first connected was when you were working with On Being and intentionally connecting with different faith leaders. I'm so curious, you know, in terms of the On Being presence, both uh, a lot of wisdom voices mm -hmm. at, at, that, you know, you, you were exposed to through that time, I assume, but then also the intentionality of having a lot of conversations with mm. faith leaders and spiritual leaders across traditions. I'm curious as to how that leg of the journey shaped you, sort of the yeah. broadness of of being in all of those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I was a um, in 2000 seven ish planted a church in Seattle, Washington called Awake Church and really was uh is still there and um this beautiful community made incredible friends and um and we did good work together and uh really was a neighborhood church. So we were kind of in the shadow of some big mega churches out there that like generated a lot of a lot of buzz, got a lot of attention. And yet I look back and I see just the things, the faithful acts of service and showing up and being present and showing hospitality to one another, the things that our community was a part of. And it was like, I mean, just life changing. It was just changed my life and mm -hmm. taught me so much. Um, and I was there for about a decade. And then I, and what I would say though, is 
this part, part of the the call. So I'm someone who's, um, you know, I read I read this thing about um, John Keats, who's like an English romantic poet. I I don't know a ton of his work, but I I, I came across this line about him and said he was a man, and I'll, I'll use a different word here, but he was a man in love with his purpose. And I realized, like I admit. Full disclosure, I've been someone who my whole life has, uh, or at least for as long as I can remember, I've, I've, I've been in love with my purpose. Now, I'll, I'll, qual I'll say I've been in like a, a love affair, and it hasn't always been easy. And there's a lot of like wondering, like, what, like, what am I here for? Like, what is mine to do? Um, so that's always been a central thing. But what I'll say is like in that, that you know, I felt fully alive. When I was doing the, the church plant work with Awake and that community, um, I was like, I'll do this forever. I love this, you know? Mm. Um, and there was a certain way that like we like in that season as a church planter and kind of the space we were in, we I'll describe it this way, like we orbited really far outside the denominational system, but mm. probably all, also some of the kind of the, the doctrinal stuff. Like we were very much about practice and belonging and, you know, imitating the ways of, of Jesus. So I named that because after that 10 years, after a little bit, I ended up taking a role within this denomination. Uh, like in part of that was like, I'm going to have a seat at the table. I'm going to work for change from within. Mm -hmm. And very early on, I was like, it was a little bit like, wow, like what am I doing here? Um, it, it was intense and it was, you know, it felt like in a lot of ways it was like, um, yeah, it, it didn't feel like a great fit for me. And I realized how much I had changed and grown in that previous 10 years, right? I bring this up to say that, that like throughout this whole time, there was always a sense of, even in the church planting years, I felt like my call, my purpose was always like further to the fringes of what, what I understood church to be. Okay. Mm. So when I came into the denominational, I felt like I was backtracking in a way. Turns out that was exactly the season I needed to like go on this soul journey. I ended up coming out of that four years later, um, in terms of that, that role, but, um, the on being, I met on being folks and been affiliated with some stuff earlier, but I started a role there. And so, um, yeah, I got to work with religious and spiritual leaders from across traditions. And I'll just say like, when I, I felt like it was a homecoming in a lot of ways, so I was like, Oh, Oh, like I'm getting to be in these broader spaces. I'm getting to hear the perspectives and learn from the wisdom of all these different people. Um, so it felt like a fantastic fit, met incredible people. And, um, you know, to, to come back to a little bit, what you're asking is the cool thing was I was writing this book as I was in that job. So basically oh, I wow. get up, I get up first thing in the morning, I meditate, I come right for like an hour, hour and a half, mm. walk upstairs, help get the kids, help my wife, you know, get the kids out the door. We'd have breakfast together, whatever. And then I'd have to get on, it was during the pandemic. So I'm like getting on zoom mm -hmm. every day and I was a remote worker, but I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that like being around the conversations of on being, whether that was like the weekly podcast that was being released or being exposed to other um, kind of um, thought leaders that are within that community, it absolutely like made its way into my writing um it just kept it kept like this big expansive lens on things i guess that's maybe the best way to say it yeah yeah i love how you describe the expansiveness and yet a sense of coming home because i mean really what i'm doing right now this is the first time proper i've done something more interfaith multi-faith been a part of these mm -hmm. conversations but in terms of uh just being director at the center for spiritual life and it's so fascinating how and i'm in my new little Advent book, I I reflect a good bit on my relationships with the Imam and the Rabbi here, because all these things that before would have been, my world was just closed enough that there's always this sense of oh whatever lies the other side. Well, we don't know what that is. Yes, <laughs> We're yes. nothing but fear, and it's like really, oh no, like this has been. I've never, I really have never felt like my soul is more at home hmm. than it is right now. Really, within this diversity of of expression, which. Which I do find to be an interesting contour of the journey is while, you know, mm -hmm. I've held to certain particulars of my own faith system, there is this real way that this journey to me, I mean, I increasingly believe is more similar than dissimilar, I think, mm -hmm. no matter where you come from, if you're being, if you're kind of awake, does that, does that ring true for you in terms of maybe even if our contexts are very different, certain beliefs are very different that there is a universality to to this kind of story yeah i mean i 
I absolutely believe that. I think, you know, um, whoever wants to save their life must lose it. I think, you know, I think we could, um, we could look at different quotes from teachers from across, you know, I, I love thinking, for example, like Jesus says to a, a rich young ruler, right? Like go sell everything and follow me. And then I, I look at like um, in stories from the Buddhist tradition, like that's literally what like the Buddha like left his rich, you know, um, like kingdom that he's a part of and like left it all to go like figure out what it actually means to be human. Uh, so I kind of love like when we let these stories, you know, get into conversation with one another. Yeah. Um, what's really cool, like this is not something. So here, here, I think there's a, multiple ways to like you you can do that both from someone who's like doesn't necessarily locate themselves within any one of the traditions. Like you can sure. look. Um, there's also it's also super cool if you say, you know, I feel like I've, I'm still firmly rooted in this one tradition, the so Christian tradition. It, that's a really beautiful place to be. Or I would say maybe how I would define myself these days, though I'm I'm kind of like defining it isn't that important to me. It's like I still just acknowledge that. I think I say like this is the part of the pool I was swimming in most of my life. Like it's yeah. absolutely. I mean, you can hear it in how I talk. It's still in me. Okay, so. Sure. Um, but I think when we let these convers these different stories be in conversation with one another, we we start to hear things at a deeper level, like within yeah. our own tradition. Yeah. So, um, and why is that? That's because there are elements of this pattern that show up again and again across the board. It's undeniable. When you talk about the pattern, and I want certainly want to honor uh, honor your time here, but I, it might be weird then more to end with the beginning but um i know your own the the story you tell about your own life starts with a moment of of disenchantment which i love for you to talk about and um because one of the questions i had for you is it's like the these even the language that jesus uses about not only losing your life to find it which i think about so much these days but being born again and there is a kind of crisis to that um do you is this a path that people can, can you just decide to do this? Can you just choose to do this? Um, I'd love to know what your reflections on that. And also a bit about where you situate mm. the, the the moment yeah. where you sense that you were going to have to go on a, a very different kind yeah. of journey and how that happened to you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll begin with that story, which is, um, one day, like early morning, I was out for a run in the rain in Seattle. And it's like, like I did all the time. And I was um, charging up a hill, about to like sprint the last 10 blocks home. And I got to the top of the hill and just these words welled up within me. And, and it was, if you don't have your heart, you have nothing. Mm. And, you know, I knew right away, I was just like, it was, it was an invitation uh, I ended up like stumbling home, like literally I crawled in bed, like wet and sweaty. I like wanted to hide in the cave. And that's because I knew that like, you know, at a surface level, I was like, I was totally burned out. But I also knew that underneath that there was this, this sense of like the, the way that I was moving through the world just didn't work anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that began a journey. Um, now, fortunately, it's like that day I, I had a lunch meeting scheduled with a mentor. I cleaned everything off. Like I cleared everything off my schedule kept that one thing thanks to the wisdom of my wife and I went and sat with my mentor and then you know he was so encouraging so I had someone to talk to right away and then um you know which help is a critical part of the journey getting help um and then like he he like got gave me a journal like we were at, by a store and he like got me a journal and kind of reactivated that spiritual practice and you know then another thing and another thing so there's all these these things that one step take the next step take the next step um and I didn't realize when I began, like how deep of a journey, like how much deep healing I actually needed and what I had to let go of and what I needed to leave behind. Right. So on one level to come back to that other aspect of the question, like I actually do. I mean, some people would say like, Oh, people won't learn stuff. They're not willing to learn until they hit rock bottom. I think that's probably true for some people, or guess what? We see it, we see it happening. So then we say that's true. Yeah. But also, because I think I'm one of them, like, I don't think I hit rock bottom. I think there were other levels that I could have descended to and things I could have done to screw up my life yeah. that, you know, if I had not paid attention to, you know, the whispered warning that was coming my way. And there were other warnings that I don't, you know, that I think I sort of bypassed. So there's things like, you know, if you're 
experiencing significant discontentment or yeah. you're you are going through some transition like you're graduating or you're you know you're a yeah. job change or a divorce or there's something else tr like you know painful and traumatic happening these often are invitations into you know to to em embark on this journey um but they they don't always come like in the most intense or dramatic form to come back to something we were talking about earlier i just think um we can be, uh, if we just slow down enough, this is where I think this practices of solitude and mm. stillness, if we start to do some of those things, we will tune into the fact that, okay, like here's maybe the next step or here's some, some ways I need to start doing some work on myself and getting, get yeah. some help and get some healing. Yeah, that's really good. Because I think it's not, it's not so much about hitting rock bottom, but there are these even more gentle ways just of, of hitting the wall, where for me, the thread seems to be the script that I've had for my life, the assumptions that I've carried are not working out the way, <laughs> the yes. way that I hoped or the way I was told that they would. And th there's, there's something that's, that's misaligned. There's something that's just not, that's not in synchronicity, but I love that, you know, you don't have to just like, crash mm -hmm. in order to listen to that and to, and to hear that. Um, one more question I would ask you, Ben, because I, this is very much, for you as a writer and knowing you've been in this journey a long time, this, I, I always, I always want to ask this of anybody who's written a, a book that I, that I love because these things do take time. And this now has been written for a minute and waiting, you know, for the, for the release out in the world. I'm curious, what is something that you have come to see more deeply or possibly more differently? I don't know. Something on the other side that like, Oh, Mm -hmm. In this last year of sitting with this content, maybe something even in terms of revisiting it, where, where how it looks different to you now. What what, what would sort of be the postscript Oof. to the book that other people have not read yet? <laughs> no, this is what's wild about it. Um, so what I would say, is, there's definitely an experience of um, picking up this book and, um, you know, so I know you just did this for your new, your new book. You got, you recorded an audio book. What a trip, right? Yeah. It's fun. So I got to do that for my book. I won the audition. I got to read it. I'm glad it's in my <laughs> voice. Um, but the, like going through it, there's a sense. I'm like, you know, I know I live this. I know I live this. And, um, and, but I, did I write it? Like, that's mm -hmm. kind of the weird thing. Like I look back and, and some the writing is a lot of it is, is kind of a blur. And I know this isn't the mm -hmm. same for everyone. A lot of writers would be like, it was torture. It was awful. Um, I never want to do that again. And I kind of feel like, um, I just, I really love the craft and that's the thing. I just, I, I'll say a couple things on the, I love talking about the creative aspects of this stuff. Okay. So one is there was the younger version of myself, first half of life had a lot of books in them. I wanted mm -hmm. to write books and was driven to write books. I had friends who were writing books. I never wrote a book. Um, and there's such a grace in that because, mm. because um, I would have writ written books that I didn't need to write that like, yeah. you know, saying things that I don't need to say and forcing something. Mm. Now this arrived, um, you know, we moved across the country. We left Seattle after 14 years and, you know, I'd done this one man show, Mr. Mystical. And it's like the material, it's like, I did it. I left it behind. And then like, it kind of came up again after we moved. And I, it was like, pay attention. There's more stories to tell here. So I started sitting with that more. I started going through old journals. Um, I was reading Joseph Campbell at the time. So these connections were happening. I was working at On Being. And um, it was very clear that all these things, you know, so I, I'll say when I look back at it now, right, mm -hmm. it's very clear all these things were converging for that moment, for this story, this, for this story to be written. Um, so I'm really grateful for... Um, yeah, I'm just really grateful for for that opportunity um, and excited to get this in people's hands to see how it speaks to them. You know, um, I feel like there's one more thing I wanted to accent about the creative process. Um, that's all I got for now. Well, the, I'm so glad you took it there because I, I, I love those to hear about anybody else's creative process. And incidentally, it, it uh, not surprising at this point. I mean, that so connects with me too, because also far from finding writing to be laborious, I feel like it always for me is a little euphoric and strange and I don't know what I'm doing at the time. And it takes a while to have any yes. idea what it is, you know, because yes. it wasn't like a, it's not so much grinding it out. It's more like 
always seems to come out of some sort of fury yeah. and uh, not necessarily being furious, but some sort of fury and like, kind of like, then it takes a while to kind of see, but I do, I do feel like the, your book is such a living book in that way that it comes out of lived experience where then people will find their own experiences and their mm. own stories and their own journeys illuminated as they go precisely because yeah. it uh, do uh, there is such a sense of spirit on it and mm. and it's lively and uh so i'm just i'm so grateful to be able to get this book into people's hands mm. because i think this is the path and what is what journey is there really besides going home right is yeah. there is that we're all yeah. yes figure? yes yeah you know i want thanks for all that i the one other thing i want to say is about here's the other aspect like i you know the younger version of me would have because of my attachments to things like being productive and successful and achieving like i would have um i I would not have been able to go about it the way i did like this i i will say and and this is not the one way i want to but i wrote it i wrote the whole thing like i just knew i needed to write it and i didn't know is this just for my kids is it just for like my own record is it to share with friends then it was like, will I self-publish this? Or like, how am I going to get that? Like, so I finished it. And then it was time to ask the question, like, what am I doing with this? Okay. And it became very clear through a bunch of circumstances that felt very consistent with like the story of the book. That's like these doors open and this thing happened, you know, and I share that I want to, you know, just sort of acknowledge you, like just coming out of a season of creating something. Now your process was, was, uh, it was both very, very much the same in that you knew you had to do it. You were just like, you had to yeah. pay attention to the thing you were being asked to do. Yeah. Now, it also was like uh, super condensed and like fast paced and, you know, not drawn out. And for some people, that might be the way. I just think there's yeah. this, you know, I shot, I shouted you out of my sub stack because I'm just so like, I just so admire when people are like, here's the thing I know I need to do mm. and uh, I need to move forward and not get distracted by how or what others are doing. And, and I know for a fact it's true for you and it's a hundred percent true for me. Um, it wasn't like pushing forward in a selfish way. It's like, cause I yeah. guess what, like you have Nicole and I have Cherie and I had yeah. someone or, or it could be a friend or some, you know, a mentor, someone else who's like in your corner and like helping you stay in tune with yourself as you are going yeah. about this, what can be crazy creative process. Mm, absolutely. Well, well, Ben, it's good to know that Chat GPT did not generate your book, and there's not AI narration. It's real, nope. like it's so. <laughs> it's really me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's so, that's so true. It's like the kind of like there's a wildness to it, but then you know, hopefully, we have people around us that keep us uh, truthful with ourselves yeah. and with yeah. and with and with them. Um, but man, it's such a it it is such a gorgeous book and even when you talk about the craftsmanship which didn't feel self-referential at all but it, it is beautifully written so i know that's another reason i am excited for people to read it is that i do think it uh it's so artfully delivered and, mm -hmm. and i don't know but you know you're just such a kindred spirit i mean this sort of i, I don't know if people ever um i i mean i'm i'm, I'm a large i try to shrink myself down and, and things come up bigger than i need to even the fact that all this stuff culminated for you of like <laughs> a one man show for your birthday. I'm like, uh, of course you did. Yeah. I'm that person who would like, okay, you know what? You know what the world needs yeah. is a one man show <laughs> from me called Mr. Mystical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my poor friends, my poor friends. <laughs> no, they're great. And that's the thing. There's a community behind this. Um, you know, I, that's, I don't, don't live there anymore. That's, that was sort of the bittersweet part is mm. finishing this, but we are going back to Seattle. I'm going to do like a, an event the week of the book and, that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's the whole thing too. It's like, there's so many people to thank and yeah. you know, they're, they, most of them are in the, the acknowledgements. And of course I couldn't get to everyone. Um, but you know, something I wanted to thank you for is one of the things you told me when you sent the endorsement my way, it was like, you know, there's the endorsement and then there's like the commentary about yeah. the endorsement yeah. or, and you said to me, you're like, you named it as pastoral, like how pastoral I was. And like, I just felt really, I felt really seen because, you know, they're, they're, as much as I'm at peace with it, like the fact is I left a pastoral identity. Like I left that. Yeah. And um, that's not exactly hard for everyone who, who knows me, sure. right? There's a lot that comes when you leave something like that or leave behind my ordination or leave a religious affiliation, like brings up all sorts of questions and it's difficult for people. Um, so for you to see this thing that um, I just felt really seen and but it's like that even if I'm not like, 
wearing that title, for example, that like that's still an essential way that I do at my best when I'm connected to my heart. That's the way I move through the world. So um, thanks. I'm glad you had that experience. And thanks for calling that out because I, I felt I feel like that really um, that invites me even as I go and like talk about this and share it with the world to keep showing up in that way, which is the true way to who I am. Well, it's uh, not to just not drag this out, but I just I love this so much because not only do I remember that distinct impression, I thought I feel shepherded from this mm. book. I feel like I'm being pastor. This feels like warm, rich, like real, like pastoral work. But I think that's another yet another point of convergence for us is that mm. it feels like the further I've gone from, for lack of a better word, a certain more like kind of conventional form of ministry. I'm doing a truer form of that thing than ever. Like, I feel like I've never pastored more. Yes. It's never like, I, oh, I'm, I'm yes. doing the thing a thousand yes. percent now, you know? <laughs> oh, I love the way you phrase that. That's, yeah, that's real. That's real. Well, thank you for the, for that pastoral presence and gift that this book is. And a, as we get closer, I'll certainly be pushing it every direction that I, uh, mm -hmm. that I know how, because I legitimately think this is a gift that's going mm -hmm. to grow people and, uh, and again, help people find themselves in in the larger yeah. story. And uh, what what a precious thing that is. So thank you so much, yeah. my friend, for this book. And thank you for this time. It's really, really rich. Yeah. Thanks so much. This has been so lovely to to talk. And I look forward to more of it. Absolutely. We'll do it again soon, friend. Thank you. All right. Thanks.